This is an introduction to Chinese history. The aim is to give you a basic background to China's history and culture so you can more easily make sense of the 100-year period from 1900 to 2000. In the Western system of writing, we use alphabets in which symbols represent the sounds themselves, such as a, b, k, g. Chinese, however, use logograms. These symbols actually represent the whole word or short syllables. So here we have the symbol for friendship, happiness, fortune and prosperity. Because Chinese use such a different form of writing, there are different ways of making that or converting that into English. The two main forms are Pinyin and Wei Giles. The Pinyin is the much more modern system, and that gives us words like Beijing, Guangzhou, Mao Zedong. But you often see the Wei Giles system used, or actually far more commonly, you see the Pinyin and then the Wei Giles system. Geographically, China has quite a few neighbours. You've got Russia, it's one of its most important and powerful neighbours. You've got Mongolia here. Um, also down here you've got India, Nepal, Bhutan, and down here to Laos and Vietnam. Over here, just out of the off side of the map, you've got Japan. Now, Beijing currently is the capital. It hasn't always been the capital, but it's currently the capital of China. You've got the three or four main rivers. You've got the Songhua River, you've got the Yellow River, the Yangtze River, and the Pearl River. Out here to the west you have Tibet, which we're going to talk about in a bit, and you've got other key areas like Shanghai and Tianjin. Looking a bit more closely at the geography, you can see that the most fertile regions are going to be here, on the east coast, and also up here into what is Manchuria. You can think of China becoming gradually more and more mountainous the more westward you go, until you get to here, where you have on the border of Nepal, Mount Everest. This area here is Tibet. Now, Tibet is extremely high, but it's a plateau. It's a high mountainous plateau. Um, you can see the tributaries of the Yangtze River and also the Yellow River here. And you notice also here, there's quite some low level ground as well. One place we haven't mentioned so far is Taiwan, with its capital of Taipei. This is now an independent country, um, separated from China in 1949. This map shows you some more of the geographical features of China. You've got the couple of deserts, you've got the Gobi Desert over here, and over here you've got the Taklamakan Desert. You can see also again the, how it gets more mountainous the more westwards you go. And you can see, as we mentioned earlier, the more fertile regions around the east coast and up into Manchuria. The Chinese refer to the country as Zhongguo, which basically means the Middle Kingdom. It's made up of two characters. We see here the simplified Chinese characters. The first character means central middle and shows a piece of land and then through the middle a line suggesting this is the center. And you have here Gu, another piece of land. Here this symbol represented a king and this small little mark here represents the treasure or jewel. So you have here a kingdom with a king but it's closed in. The borders are shut because they're protecting their treasure. And together these two symbols, the Middle Kingdom, represent Zhongguo, China. It's worth getting to know the main or most important provinces you're going to have to deal with. So we have here, we have Beijing. Uh, next to it, we've got Tianjin, which is kind of entry point to Beijing. But we've got here the province of Hebei and the province of Shandong. You've got here two provinces, Shanxi and Shanxi. And then you've got a series of three provinces beginning with H. So you've got Henan, Hubei, Hunan. Back towards the coast, you've got Anhui, and then right down here, the very important province actually of Guangdong. Uh, today, you've got Hong Kong and Macau on the coast of Guangdong. Over here, I've mentioned Taiwan already, and over here, of course, we have Tibet, the high mountainous plateau. Going through that again, so we have Beijing, what is now the capital and Tianjin, which is down on the coast. You have the province of Hebei, and the province of Shaanxi, 
and Shaanxi. And in Shaanxi you have Xi'an, which is where the terracotta warriors are. Um, it was also an imperial city at one point. You have the three H's of Henan, Hubei, Hunan. And within Hubei you also have the major town of Wuhan. Heading back to the coast, you have the province of Anhui, with its major city of Hefei. You then have on the coast, Jiangsu, with the town of Nanjing, which became an imperial center at one point. Shanghai here, and then the major city of Hangzhou. The province of Fujian, with Fuzhou. Over here you have Taiwan and Taipei. Further down south, you have Guangdong, with its capital of Guangzhou. You've got Hong Kong and Macau right on the coast as well. It's also worth mentioning uh, Jiangxi here, with its capital of Nanchang. Out towards the west, you have two regions that China conquered last. You have Tibet, with its capital of Lhasa, and you have Xinjiang as well. Now, these were the two provinces that were the last to come within China, and in some sense the Chinese are even more desperate to hold on to them for that reason. Looking again at this map, look at the main cities. Again, we have Beijing, we have Tianjin. Down here you have Shanghai and Nanjing, which was at one point uh, the capital. Further west you have Xi'an. Down here, a place we haven't mentioned so far, is Chongqing. Right down south you have Guangzhou, Hong Kong and Macau. And heading back up, you have Wuhan, Hefei, and then also Zhengzhou. Confucius was the great Chinese scholar and philosopher whose ideas and writing have done a huge amount to shape the Chinese character and way of life. Uh, he lived around the 5th century BCE, which means before the Common Era. Um, now, that's the same time as Socrates was teaching, around that same time in Athens, and the Buddha also in India. So, the 5th century BC or BCE was a time of huge intellectual change going on. Confucius taught that war and chaos are the two great evils because they are what produces the most suffering and the most misfortune for humans. And therefore, harmony was the highest good. And by that he meant harmony in living with the people around us. The key to that, he taught, was to obey authority and maintain the status quo. That any attempt to disrupt the status quo was likely to lead to war and chaos. He also developed the idea of the mandate of heaven. Essentially, this could be thought of more in terms of fate. And it justified the authority of the emperor and his dynasty. If everything was going well, that showed that the person in charge had the mandate of heaven. However, if things were going badly, that showed that he didn't have the mandate of heaven, and therefore it was totally acceptable to try and overthrow him. However, if you failed to overthrow him, that showed you did not have the mandate of heaven, and therefore you'd be punished, and justifiably punished, severely. This acceptance of hierarchy and acceptance of authority uh, lay at the heart of Confucius. For him, subjects should obey the emperor, and wives should obey the husbands, and children should obey their parents. And the focus, therefore, was on social cohesion through acceptance of that hierarchy and uh, authority. This led to, therefore, quietism, an acceptance of fate that uh, you should protect the status quo as far as possible. Now, one symbol of this acceptance of authority was the practice of kowtowing, whereby you prostrated yourself on the floor before the person of higher authority to show that you accepted their authority.